All right, hello everyone. Thank you all for coming to our USA Computing Olympiad for Absolute Beginners workshop. I'm Nathan Wang. And the other panelist is Melody. Okay, hi, we're gonna get started. So welcome again to this workshop. I'm gonna try and introduce Yusuko and then give a couple tips for starting out. So to start out, what is Yusuko? So most of the questions on the website are centered around Farmer Don and his cows because this was a competition basically founded by Dr. Don Pele in the University of Wisconsin Parkside. Right now it's run by Dr. Brian Dean at Clemson University. So uh, the training camp, if you've heard of it, is also at Clemson University. So Yusuko is an individual online contest and it focuses on solving algorithm problems. And then the top four competitors in this contest end up getting selected for the United States team for the International Olympiad of Informatics, also known as the IOI. Okay, so why do Yusuko? First and the most obvious reason is college applications. So if you end up getting into the higher divisions, which I'll talk about more later, it definitely helps with your college applications. So for example, the silver and sorry, gold divisions, the Top 200 competitors are in platinum, and then the top 1,000 competitors are in gold. So if you're able to reach any of those divisions, it's a great add-on to your resume. The other thing it's useful for is actually tech interviews. Uh, most of the tech interview questions are usually the same levels as around silver or gold. So before we get any further, I actually have... Um, I believe Dr. Brian Dean is here today. So he's currently running the USCO. He is in charge of it. Uh, I believe he's here in the Zoom meeting right now. Yeah, so if you'd like to unmute, say something, yeah. Okay, well, he's here today. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Hey there, thanks. Um, so uh, it's uh, um, uh, really great to, to get a chance to, to see all you guys. Um, and thanks especially to Melody and all the organizers for running this event. I think it's wonderful to see the you know students involved with USACO uh, promoting the competition and, and uh, kind of explaining how everything works uh, to their fellow students. Uh, so as you guys know, uh, USACO has, has two main goals. One of them is to train a team of the top students from the USA uh, to compete at the International Olympiad Informatics. Uh, but the other goal is to just simply promote computing at the high school level and hopefully to inspire youngsters like yourselves uh, to appreciate computational problem solving and, and maybe fall in love with a discipline that might ultimately lead to you know, future study and, and a career. Um, our problems may seem kind of you know, silly and contrived and they're all about cows and whatnot, uh, but they actually uh, are surprisingly relevant in a, a large range of, of real world uh, situations. So the skills that you learn in USACO uh, really do translate to down the road, uh, very practical skills that you could apply to a wide range of, of settings. Uh, so it's really great to see all you guys uh, participating in an event like this. Um, it's, uh, I'll, I'll probably hang around here in the background in case any of you have questions about USACO and its history and, and uh, how everything works, uh, but I'll turn everything back over to, uh, to you guys to, to continue the event. Thank you so much. So yeah, like uh, Dr. Dean was saying, uh, USACO is really useful in lots of different ways. Okay, so how do you actually attend the contest? So if we go on the website, uh, you'll see on the right side, we have the 2022-2021 schedule. And so what ends up happening is in the following months of December, January, February, and then March slash April, also known as the US Open Contest, since it's harder uh, for a weekend in these months. And then uh, the schedule usually comes out beforehand and it'll give you the dates. Basically a time slot is going to open and then the website, sorry, the website is going to show a location for you to basically attend the competition. All you have to do beforehand is register an account. Once you have an account and you have your settings, you don't need to do anything else until the dates of the competition. So for example, right now, since the schedule isn't out yet, I just look, I have my account and then I'm getting ready for the next season and for the schedule to come out and that's all I have to do. 
And then once the time actually does come out and then the uh, schedule happens, then it'll show a different location on the website, like on the home screen, and it'll allow you to basically click start. Once you click start, it's going to give you a block of four hours to solve three questions in division in your division. The only exception to that is the US Open, again, March slash April, since it's five hours for three questions. After you click start and then you see your three questions in your division and it ends, then you're done for that month, basically. Yeah. So you can also look at all of the past contests on their website. If you go to contests here, you're basically able to see all of the older contests and then all of the problems. So if I click onto any one of these, it'll give you all of the divisions and then it'll give you the three questions for that. So if you want to go and you want to practice for Usico, I recommend going on the website and they have all of these problems since the best way to practice is just to look at the old problems and actually try and solve them. Okay, so again, Usico is designed to select the top four members for the IOI team, but to get there, you have to climb through the divisions. Everyone starts out in bronze, and then once you get a high enough score in that division, you get promoted to the next division. I'll talk about later how you do that and the scores, but for now, the different divisions are bronze, silver, gold, and then the added platinum. For bronze and silver are pretty much basic algorithms. Gold, you start learning more advanced things, and then platinum is very hard algorithms. From the platinum competitors, after you go and then you compete, uh, out of these people, the finalists, and you can see them on the website, are chosen to go to a training camp. So if you see the 2020-2021 finalists here, when you click on this, it gives you the list of finalists for the year. So out of the platinum and then sometimes gold competitors, uh, they'll pick the different finalists to go to the training camp. And then out of the people in the training camp, the IOI is chosen. Bronze is everyone's level. So if you've never competed before, you are a bronze contestant. And then just a bit of like terminology, once you pass a level, like passing bronze, you'll be a silver competitor. So after passing bronze, you'll have access to see the silver questions during the next competition. The three main languages for Usico are Python, Java, and C++. If you haven't set it up yet, I would definitely recommend getting an IDE and setting it up. So if you don't have anything or you don't know what it is, I would also recommend the Usico guide IDE. So uh, it's basically a place for you to create a collaborative online ID. I'll paste it in the chat. So if you don't have a place to type or work on your code, I would recommend going here. So the other places you can get an IDE, there are lots of different things, but if you don't know where yet, I would recommend uh, for Python, PyCharm, and for Java, IntelliJ IDEA. So those two are both by JetBrains, and then uh, you can click on the JetBrains website in order to download and install it on your computers. Those two are both free. If you don't have, uh, or you don't use Python and Java, then there's also C++ and they have the JetBrains equivalent, which is C-Line. And then I personally use C-Line, but it, I believe it does cost money. So I would also recommend Visual Studio Code. And if you're on a Mac, Xcode. So if you are working on Usico, you should definitely get an IDE so you can debug, so you can store your code. So please do check it out. Okay, so for a bit of extra information, uh, I have a bit of different advice for pers my personal advice for you getting into Usico. So the next couple slides are all my personal advice and experience. It might not apply to everyone, so please don't feel pressured or don't feel like this is something you have to abide by. For language recommendation, the typical recommendation is to use C++. For bronze, I'd recommend Python just because it's easier to learn and there are lots of built-in data structures. For example, things like string split or sets and dictionaries that are built in, it's a lot easier to type out. And just because it's less lengthy to type, like just literally looking at code, you can see that it's a lot shorter. So I would recommend if you're just going to do bronze to use Python because it's just easier to type out, it's easier to understand, and you have more time to think about algorithms and other things. For anything above bronze, however, I and then most other people do recommend C++. So like in the chat, um, I believe Nathan Wong and then Brian Dean are putting in some information. So there's a whole section on the Usico guide, uh, putting in choosing languages. And then most people do recommend C++ for a variety of reasons. 
Um, first, it does have easier input and output. That doesn't apply as much now, but it still does. Uh, it also has faster running speed and then especially handy library functions, especially for higher divisions when you don't have the time to write out like a binary search, things like lower bound and upper bound, which are built in binary searches or functions like next permutation or it's not on the slide, but built in pop count, a built in function in GCC. Uh, all of these different library functions in C++ are especially useful. Uh, I see a question in chat asking what bit slash stdc++.h is. Uh, basically, since you have to, uh, if we look at C++, you have to include a lot of different things. It's just a handy like include that basically includes everything. So it, it'll basically just, instead of having to do IO stream and all these different things, you only have to include bits stdc++, and then that pretty much includes everything. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, so again, the USICO guide, which I'll talk about more later, it has a lot of information uh, for you to check out all of these things. So for above bronze, again, C++ has a lot of different things. It also has things like STL, DEX, multisets, multimaps. It just has a lot of different built-in functions. It's fast and it's easy input output, which is why I personally recommend it, especially if you really want to get into a high level. The other language option is Java, and then most people actually end up using it, especially just because uh, for AP computer science, which is a very valid reason. It has a lot of things like hash sets, hash maps, and especially big integer that I've heard about that are very useful. So languages are completely up to you, but my personal recommendation is just to use Python for bronze and then anything else just to use C++. Okay, so setting up your development environment is kind of tricky. Uh, this slide is just some handy information. If you're still setting up your IDE or you want to know, this is my personal development environment. Uh, I use a Mac OS X or a PC Ubuntu uh, just because it's easier for version control for like GitHub so I can manage versions of my code. I also end up using the JetBrains IDE. So that's the thing I recommended earlier with PyCharm, IntelliJ, and CLine, just because they share the same IDE. So uh, when you end up having to switch between languages or if you want to just kind of use a friendly environment, uh, I would definitely recommend it. And this is the thing that I personally use. Uh, this isn't an advertisement, but uh, Python and the IntelliJ are free. CLine does, again, cost money. So VS Code, Xcode. Down here, I also have a couple of things I've added just because they're useful. Um, so if you want to save a bit of this information for setting up your own environment, I would recommend doing that. Okay, so a lot of people end up asking like, how does, it, how does a typical experience look like? Uh, so again, this is completely my personal experience. Uh, your journey is probably gonna look different. Uh, but basically, I ended up learning Python, and then after that, in order to pass bronze, the different data structures, like sets and maps, I learned in order to pass bronze. So those are all very useful, and then I would definitely recommend uh, to pass bronze. And then personally, I ended up learning C++ and Java, and then learning a couple of algorithms. I passed gold and silver together, which is why this is a bit messy, but there are different different algorithms like binary search, prefix sum, and then especially DFS, and then other harder algorithms like DP, Dijkstra's, MST, DSU. Uh, all of these different algorithms are useful for passing silver. So I ended up keep uh, learning more DP, other algorithms, passing gold, and then that's pretty much what my experience looks like now. I'm still learning, still trying to pass. Okay, so obviously this isn't going to give you enough information to work. Um, I got a question in the chat asking if 11th grade is too late to start? Definitely not. I mean, it depends because uh, this period of time for me personally was about, uh, it was, it just, if you go intensively, you can probably get pretty high in about a year or so. Um, but if you just like kind of have other stuff to do, then obviously your timing is gonna be different. So I know a lot of people who are able to get from like bronze to platinum in about a year. Uh, I learned Python from a lot of various different places. I can link some resources later. Okay, so for actually working up the levels, I believe there are a bunch of different things in the chat, but right now I would definitely recommend the use code guide. So this is the website, and then it has a lot of especially useful resources. So if you go here in these sections, if you're just starting out, the bronze section is very useful. So like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of different things that I learned. Um, 
stuff like binary search or like uh, especially algorithms like, for example, greedy algorithms or like uh, simulation. I mentioned earlier that it's very useful if you want to get into Usico to look at the old questions. Obviously, there are a lot of old questions, so things like the Usico guide are very useful for basically narrowing down and giving you a couple questions to learn. So if you're starting late, then I would recommend using sites like this just because it gives you a smaller amount of questions to make sure you learn all of the things you need to do. And then it helps you track your progress so you can track to see if it's complete or not. Um, and I would just definitely recommend this as a resource. So it's the Usico guide. I'll talk about it again later at the end. Um, for the old contest, it's just the overview and then you click contests here and it'll give you all of the past contests. Uh, I personally do a lot of my programming just based on this. So uh, I would definitely recommend going over and looking at the old uh, questions. Also, if you have any questions, uh, we are going to do a Q&A section at the end, and then I'll try and answer, and then Nathan Wong will, well, sorry, Nathan will also be there to answer the questions, so please try and hold off till the end for that. Okay, so with your divisions, you have to basically get a high enough score to pass. So if I pass bronze, I would get in silver, and so on and so forth. And then the way passing works is you get at most 1,000 points. So in each of these divisions, there are going to be three questions. If I click on this for every division, you have three questions for you to solve. Again, that's going to be four hours. And then if it's the US Open, five hours. In order to pass, you get at most 1,000 points. So each question is going to be worth the same amount. So 1,000 over three, 333 points. And then the test cases are usually going to be from 10 to 20 test cases. Uh, for example, if I were to click on a question, uh, this specific question has 13 test cases. Each one of these boxes is going to represent a test case or uh, basically input data that it's going to run your program through. And then if you get the test case right, it's going to show with this green box with an asterisk. And then if you get it wrong, there are other different symbols that I'll explain later. The way it actually scores is the earlier test cases don't matter less than the later test cases. And what that means is it's evenly divided between the test cases. So three questions, each worth 333 points. So your score is going to be the 333 divided by the number of test cases in problem one, plus 333 divided by the number of test cases in problem two, and then the same thing for problem three. And what that means is if I have, for example, two questions, one of them has 13 test cases, one of them has 10, then the question with 10 test cases, each test case is going to be worth more. And then if you solve like the first three test cases and then someone else solves the last three test cases, your points are going to be exactly the same. So definitely try and solve as many of these boxes as possible, just because it's not going to give you more points for solving like test case 13 than for solving test case one. The points is basically uh, put as evenly as possible. It's just 333 divided by one test case. Okay, so usually the cutoff score is going to be around 750 out of 1000. So give or take 50 points. Basically what happens is you have your three questions and then it'll calculate your points based off of the number of test cases you solved. So the score, um, the maximum amount of points you can get is 1,000. So immediate promotion, I saw someone asked in the chat, means you get all points right. So during a live contest, for example, during December, uh, you click in, you spend four hours, and then you're able to get every single question, every single test case right. In that case, it's going to display a little thing at the top, and it's going to say, congratulations, you solved, you got 1,000 points. And then it's going to give you an option to automatically go to the next level. So there are contests from December, January, February, and then US Open. And what ends up happening is if I get, for example, an 850 on my December contest, I'm done. I'm done for December. That's it. I've had my four hours. And then after this contest, give or take around a week, the results are going to come out in this contest page. And then if we click on any one of these, it's basically going to show you the cutoff score. So it'll show, for example, uh, 750 or higher, 750 or higher, 800 or higher. 
you cannot be demoted. Once you pass bronze, you are in the next division. There is no demotion, don't worry. So if you get a perfect score, it's going to allow you to automatically, let's say I get a perfect score bronze US Open, then I'm going to be able to take the silver contest in US Open. Uh, theoretically, yes, you can get to platinum in the same day. Uh, if you do manage to do that, please tell me. I would, I would really appreciate that. But um, typically, you would just maybe promote one contest. So if you get a perfect score, you're able to uh, solve and then go into the next division. You're able to see the next division questions in that same month. If you do not get a perfect score and you still pass, good for you. You are able to see the questions in the next contest. So if I pass bronze, I'm not able to see the December silver questions until they release publicly. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Uh, if you have any questions, obviously we'll have a question panel later. Okay, so I'm going to show you guys a walkthrough of the first USACO problem. So this question is actually really easy. It's like the hello world. Um, most bronze questions are not going to be around this level like at all. Uh, but just to show you how it works, the mission flow, I'm going to use Python for this question. Uh, for the 2020 December contest, we're actually going to end up going through all three questions. For the first question, this one, I'm going to use Python, and then I'll use Java, and then C++. So if you understand any of those languages, hopefully you'll be able to understand that question too. I'm going to put this in the chat right now, and then I'm going to give a couple minutes for you guys to just look at the question and then kind of understand it, read it, and then I'll go on to explain the solution. Yeah, so just type in the chat when you're ready, because I don't know if to start earlier or later. Yeah. Okay, so uh, as people have been messaging in the chat, this is a more of a logic question. Okay, so basically what happens is Farmer John and then his two cows, Essie and Bessie, sorry, Bessie, uh, who are very reoccurring characters. As Elsie is going to be giving three positive integers, A, B, and C, and then she's going to be giving seven different integers to Bessie. So that's basically going to be A, B, C, and then the various sums A, B, A plus B, B plus C, and so on. And then the key to solving this question is actually a couple words in this question. So it's actually going to be, Elsie has three positive integers, and then A is less than B, B is less than C, and so on. So because the integers are positive, we can realize that A is the smallest integer, meaning the smallest integer in the input is definitely going to be A. We can't get any smaller than that because all of the integers are positives. So A plus B is definitely going to be greater than A, and then B plus C is definitely going to be greater. So the smallest integer is going to be A. Using that same logic, the second smallest integer is going to be B, just because A plus B is definitely going to be uh, greater than B, and then C as in the question is going to be greater than B. And then for C, it's actually a little bit more tricky since we don't know if A plus B or C is the third smallest integer. 
So things like B plus C, C plus A, uh, these are obviously going to be greater since they all contain C, but we don't know if A plus B or C is greater. So we do, however, know that since, again, all of them are positive integers, A plus B plus C is going to be the greatest integer. What we can do is we can take our input with our seven numbers, and then we can sort them. So I have the answer here. A and B are the smallest numbers. The third smallest number is either A plus B or C. And then note again that C might not be the third smallest number. For example, if our input numbers are two, three, and seven, then A plus B or five is going to be smaller than C. We can solve C by finding the greatest number or A plus B plus C minus A plus B. And then just with some very hard math, we can realize that this number minus A plus B is going to be C. So this is the Python code for this answer. And then again, I definitely recommend Python just because this is all that's needed to read in the input. And I think it's clean and it's neat, but basically we read in the input and then the Python syntax for this is basically, uh, this is the input, I'm going to split it. So uh, in this case, Python syntax means it's going to split by these spaces. And then I'm going to map it into an integer, which basically means I'm going to turn all of these individual things I just got into various integers. And then I'm going to turn it into a list. So now I have a list of integers. I'm going to sort those numbers. And then this sorting command is going to sort them from least to greatest. So we can get the indexes of our arrays. And then the way to get the index is just going to be the brackets. And then I'm going to have numbers zero, basically the zeroth element, since it actually uses zero-based indexing as A, and then the first element, or actually second, as B. So these are the two smallest elements. And then the greatest element is going to be numbers negative one, which is actually the last element in numbers, and then minus A plus B. So this is going to give us A, B, and C and then we can just print our answer. If you actually go onto the contest sites, the newest input formats are all from the terminal or SDD in, which basically means we don't have to deal with input formats. If you do go into some of the older contests, for example, if I click this, then the input format is actually going to be through files. So just keep that in mind when you're working on this question. Okay, so the way we can actually submit it is you can choose your language and I can pick like Python 3.6, choose your file. And then this is from your computer. So my computer is gonna look different. And then you just select the Python file if it's Python language and then submit solution. And then it'll just find a server and it'll grade. So the different commands or the different uh, boxes are going to have different things based off of how your answer or how your code did with the test case. In this case, since the code is correct, uh, then you are able to get the green box. And then if your code is incorrect, if it returns like a completely wrong answer, this instead of an asterisk is gonna be an X. And then if you run out of time, then it's going to be a T. So these test cases you can find. Uh, when you go to the questions, then it'll sh you just click this test data and then it'll download the test data for your computer. And then in contest, you are not able to see that test data. Okay, so again, this is our code for the question. So the next couple slides aren't completely required, especially if you're like, very early bronze, but it's just something to think about, especially when you end up getting to higher divisions or with the questions getting harder, you want to try and think about some of this stuff. Since C++ does run faster, the runtime or the time allotted for Usico is different. So it actually allows two seconds for your C++ programs and then four seconds for your Java or Python programs to run. If your program runs past this, then it's just going to cut it off and you're going to see the T in the box. So for example, if I run fast enough for the first five test cases, and then I run for like uh, five seconds on the sixth one, it's going to show red and then a T. So you can estimate your program speed by counting iterations. And then if you've learned this, then that basically just means big O notation. So you're basically able to, based on the number of like loops that you use, 
count and tell how many or how fast your code is able to run. And this is useful just for roughly estimating what you're going to use to solve this question with. For example, if I have uh, roughly half billion loops, then we have something like n. And then in these questions, most of the time, this is not a good example, but most of the time it's going to give you a size for the maximum test case. For example, in daisy chains, the next question we're gonna solve, the maximum size of the number of daisies is 100. The maximum size of the number of petals is 1000. And even though this may look like inconsequential, it's actually really useful for looking at which algorithms you're going to use. In this case, we have n and then p as 100, 1000, and we can kind of use that to see how fast our program is going to run. Uh, I have a question. I see a question in the chat about a very good math foundation. Um, I'll address this later, but my personal thing is no, just because as long as you know the basics, for example, I am not good at math at all, but I, I do okay. So it's not that required. As long as you know, like some of the basics and then especially combinatorics and stuff, uh, then you should be fine. So you don't need to be like a uh, JMO level, but it's nice to have a math foundation. Okay, so for the size of n, or it's not always going to be the variable n, it's just the approximate size given in the question, you're able to basically tell how fast or which algorithms you can use. For example, we have n as 10,000, then an o n squared algorithm is going to work. And that just means like two nested for loops. And then if n is like 1 million, then based off of the time given, an n log n algorithm will work. And that just means, for example, a loop and then a binary search. So the n here, if you don't understand big O notation, is the easiest way to think about it is the number of nested loops. So if I have three nested for loops, each iterating through n, then that's just going to be o n cubed. So you can just think about it as the most amount of nested loops or nested like time lengthy operations inside of your code. Uh, this is a chart I personally kind of use. Basically, uh, depending on the question, n is going to vary a lot and you can really tell the time complexity or how fast you should be using and working on your question based off of it. For example, when we have like n is less than 80, then you can go all the way up to a four, four nested for loops. So that would be n to the power of four. If n on the other hand is like 500,000, then you can maybe only go up to an n log n program, which would just be like a loop with a binary search. So every algorithm you learn, I mentioned some earlier, for example, a uh, prefix sum or binary search, they all have a speed or like a certain amount of complexity. And if you don't know that you're the complexity, for example, if I don't know how fast a binary search is, you can always just Google it. Yeah. Um, and then based off of the complexities, then you can kind of tell to see what algorithms are going to be used. So log n, typically a binary search, and then n, loop, or some other algorithms. So I would save this chart, even if you're not at that level, just because it's helpful to be able to see around which level that you can be or around which algorithm you should be using. Okay, so for bronze and silver, I have a general outline of stuff you should be learning right now. Uh, first, obviously, you should try and learn a syntax for a language. Once you know the syntax for one language, uh, if it's Python, it's kind of different, but if it's like C++ or Java, you really don't need to go that deep into syntax. And then this is my personal recommendation, just because it's not as useful. And then if you spend all your time learning different languages, it's they're all pretty much the same once you end up learning it well. So once you've mastered a basic uh, out language, so for example, once I've learned C++, they're still pretty similar, uh, then I would definitely recommend go towards algorithms. The most important thing in Usico is still the algorithms you're learning. And then, so you should try and understand time complexity, the thing I mentioned earlier. And then you should also have an IDE to debug with, especially once you reach silver, it, it's, you definitely need to have an IDE. So that's the stuff I mentioned earlier, PyCharm, CLion, and then be able to debug with it. And then you should learn stuff like data structures. So this is just for a bronze, probably sets, maps, and then for silver, stuff like queues, stacks, graphs. Um, I would definitely recommend learning these different data structures. And once you have data structures, then move on to algorithms. Uh, yes, you, 
you can use an ID in the actual competition. Uh, there, you can only submit through a source file. So definitely please use an ID for the competition. Don't just use like Google Docs. Um, so after you've learned the general programming, you know the syntax of a language. And then even though we have recommendations, honestly, any language that runs, then go towards algorithms. So this is stuff like sorting, custom comparators, binary search, prefix sum. Uh, these are the main topics I learned for silver and bronze and just being able to pass them. If you want a more in-depth uh, basic understanding, then definitely, again, please check out the USICO guide because it has very in-depth and then the problems you should solve in order to pass. So again, stuff like simulation and then sets and maps, sorting, all of these things are very useful for bronze and silver. Okay, so I'm going to walk through the USICO problem of daisy chains using Java. And also, if you guys could like message in the chat which language you use if you or just n slash a if you don't, because I kind of want to see uh, which language I should be presenting with. In this case, I have all three languages, but I just want to know uh, which language most people use. So I'm going to paste the daisy link in the chat so you guys can see it. And then, yeah, just take a couple minutes to look at. Yeah, so it looks like an overwhelming number of people do use Python. I would definitely recommend um, just passing bronze. I know most of my pro sorry, most of my friends do pass bronze using Python, so that's totally fine. Uh, but if you end up wanting to go into silver or gold, I would definitely recommend learning Java or C++. And honestly, for uh, me personally, it was pretty easy to make the switch between the two since they're not that different. Uh, so I would definitely recommend learning Python and then maybe Java or C++ because the syntax between the two is pretty similar. Uh, most coding solutions online are also not going to be in Python. So just try and keep that in mind when uh, working and then learning. So I'm going to present daisy chains in Java. There isn't a set amount of coding languages you should be fluent at. It's um, HTML is interesting, uh, but I would definitely recommend just stick to a couple and then most of the syntax are pretty similar. So again, Java and C++ are very similar. Python is completely different, so we don't talk about it. Uh, but once you learn the syntax for a couple different things, it's good enough, go focus on algorithms. Okay, so for daisy chains, what's going to happen is Bessie is going to have N different flowers or daisies lined up in a row. Each one of these flowers is going to have P petals. And so Bessie is going to be taken different pictures. So she's going to be taking pictures of flowers from flower I to flower J, including I to J. For example, um, I'm going to be referring to these with zero based indexing. So that's going to mean this is zero, one, two, three. And then so from flower I to J, if it's from flower one to three, that would just be one, two, three inclusive. So Bessie is taking a picture and she notices that some of these pictures have an average flower. So the average sum of the petals within this range, if in this range there is a flower with that number of petals, then she has a photo with an average flower. So given the input, you want to basically give Bessie the number of photos with an average flower. Okay, so the way we're gonna solve this question is, well, actually I'm gonna show you two ways. The basic way to think about it is reading in the input and then using three for loops. So you would loop through all of the flowers for the start of the current daisy chain. So in the question, that's just going to be I. And then I'm going to loop through every value for the start. And then you're going to loop through all of the flowers for the end of the current daisy chain. So the first range I is pretty much just going to be between from 
0 to n, and then range j is going to be from i to n. So looping through these questions, and then once you loop through these two, then you go through and then you try and loop through again from the range of i to j, so this range, to get the sum of this range. And then after you do that, you get another loop from i to j to check to see if any flowers within this chain are the average. For example, the sum of these three flowers is going to be six and then divided by three, so the average is two. I would loop through to get the sum, loop through again to get to the average flower, which would be right here. And if there is an average flower within this range, then this photo does contain an average flower. I add it to my answer. This code runs in O and cubed. So that's just going to be one for loop here, one for loop here. And then even though there are two for loops here, they're next to each other, so it doesn't count. So counting basically the iterations or the loops, you only look at how fast or how much or how many loops are nested within each other. This solution does end up passing, but does anyone know a way to make it faster? So I'll give a couple of minutes to basically think of a faster solution. Okay, so the way we can actually optimize this is right now we have three nested for loops within each other. So in order to avoid this third or third and fourth loop here, we're actually just going to do the same thing for the first loop. And then we're going to keep a set of all the flower scenes so far. So this doesn't have to be a set. It can also be like a Boolean array. But this is where data structures come in use. So this is basically going to keep track of all of the flowers seen from i to our current j. So we're going to loop through all of the flowers for j. And then every time we move our j, we're going to basically check to see if there's a flower with the average. So I'll show you the code, but basically this is in Java. So we're going to read in the input and then we're going to loop through i. And then we're going to keep a set of the current found flowers. So this is all of the flowers from I to our current J. We're also going to keep the number of petals seen, aka our current sum. So every time we loop through with J, we're then going to basically go add the current petal or the current flower to our sum. And then we're also going to add it to our set. And what this does is we can then take our current sum from I to our current J, check to see if it has an average, and I'm going to use the mod command here. And if it does have an average, then I'm going to check to see if within this set, so our set called found, if it contains a flower with that number of petals, then I'm going to add one to photos. So what this basically does is every time I move my J1, I'm also going to add a current set of the number of flowers or containing all of the flowers within this range. And that way I don't have to loop through again to get my sum. And this effectively only has two four loops. And then if I do find something, I'll add one to my variable called photos, which is going to add one. And then I'll print that out. Okay, so this again is the code for the solution. So again, stuff like learning sets is really useful. I would definitely recommend learning data structures since a data structure is able to basically make your code a lot faster. So a set is actually a, a data structure. It's like a list, but it can only contain unique elements. Also, it's faster to look through. So you could just replace this with like a list, but basically a set contains only unique items. And then once you have a set and then you add elements to the set, it's really fast to be able to search the set and then see whether or not an element is in that set. So that's the basic way a set works. I would definitely recommend uh, checking out some different things, 
to see and then to basically uh, find and learn what that is. So we are a bit short on time. Uh, I am going to skip the third question, but if you do want to check it out, I would recommend checking out Stuck in a Rut. So this is the third question. It's a lot harder than these two, so I'm not going to go over it, but I would definitely recommend checking it out. And if you aren't able to solve it, uh, there are a lot of different things online that you are basically able to find the solutions. They'll explain it. There are lots of videos for that. Um, okay, so before we end up stopping, I'm going to go over a couple of resources. In the meantime, I am going to start a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please go to this link and then put the question and then I'll, we'll basically address and answer your questions there. So just go to this link. Uh, I can paste it in the chat, I believe. And then um, if you have a question, ask it on there and that way I can share your question on the slides and then we can go over them. In the meantime, um, I'm gonna let Nathan talk about the resources for Yusako. Yeah, so these resources are resources that I think are pretty great if you're looking to get started with Yusako. So first off is the Yusako guide, of course. If you're looking for text-based content to get started with Yusako, I think this is an excellent resource. It, it takes you from wherever you are, whether you're just starting out with very basic programming experience, or whether you're already at a silver level, no matter where you are, you can go to the Yusako guide and find a well-planned roadmap to get you all the way to platinum or even beyond platinum. Uh, so like following the Yusako guide is definitely one way I think that like everyone can improve at Yusako. Uh, it's like a roadmap of sorts to guide you throughout your Yusako journey. And Yusako guide is text-based. Now, the other resource, if you prefer video lectures, if you learn better through videos, uh, then there's two more resources that I can recommend. The CP initiative courses, uh, these is, is very similar to the Yusako guide. It follows the Yusako guide curriculum, but for all the problems in the Yusako guide, uh, instead of just providing written solutions, we also make video solutions for each problem. So if you learn better through video content, then perhaps you should check this out. And finally, uh, there's also StarCoder. StarCoder also provides a large number of very high quality video solutions for a whole bunch of like really good problems. So if you're just interested, you just want to try out some problems, uh, go here, just do some problems. And if you aren't quite sure how to solve a problem, watch the solution video. They're all very high quality and I find them really easy to understand. Uh, and then finally, the Yusako training pages. Uh, these are a bit older, but it's still very, very good. Uh, so it's the second link, the online training pages, and you make an account and then you're given a series of problems for you to do that are all related to Yusako. So these four resources, I think, are excellent ways to get started at Yusako. Yeah, thank you. So those are pretty much the main resources. Uh, if you have any questions or want to see them, then definitely ask. We'll put them in the chat or I'll just leave this up. So in the meantime, we have quite a few questions. I'm, we're gonna try and go through. Okay, so I'm gonna go through in the order I see them. Uh, people do actually take four hours for three problems because they are very, very hard problems. So depending on your division, I know four hours seems like a lot. It's actually not that much. Sometimes I feel like I definitely need more time, but basically, a lot of the questions are actually very hard. The questions I showed today are actually um, the very simple questions in bronze or around the same level. So the second question was around the same level, uh, but recently a lot of the questions have been getting harder. So yes, people do take four hours for three questions. Um, this one is for standard input. So you do, uh, yeah, for, Pre previous problems, you still need file input. So what that basically means is some of these say from terminal STD in. For the new questions, it's still going to be like that. But if we go to contest and then the old questions, if it like if in contest it said to read in through the file, then it's still going to be reading in through the file. So if you go on old questions, then yes, you are going to have to uh, present through files. Um, this one's a good question. You can submit multiple files for each question in competition. So what actually ends up happening um, is it'll show you all of the different submissions you've made. So you can just you can just keep submitting it. Obviously, I don't recommend spamming, but definitely uh, you are able to submit multiple files. Uh, yeah, so again, you do get a second chance to uh, submit new versions of questions. Okay, so if you are new to Yusuko, but you already have a lot of programming experience, 
uh, just try out a couple of questions. So I would definitely recommend checking out the most recent questions. Uh, and then if you check out the most recent bronze questions, then, and you find them too easy, then just make sure you can pass bronze and then keep going up. So just check out the old questions in competitions, or you can just check out the Usago guide, try out a couple of those questions there. Okay, you do not get more points if you spend less time, unfortunately. Uh, the time is not related to the points just because most of the questions are hard, they're algorithmic, sorry, algorithmic. So it's purely based off of the judging I told I talked about earlier, uh, basically how many test cases that you solve. Okay. Um, okay, sorry. What this one means is uh, you mentioned there's a new way to read in information with the newer questions. Basically, uh, if you end up learning a lot of languages, there is standard input and file input. Uh, basically, I was just trying to say that now you use standard input. If you want, check out the questions and then see how you submit. Basically, the way and the the way you read in input is completely different now. Uh, I'm trying. To, I'm not very good at explaining it, but definitely check out the website. Okay, this question here is: What happens after platinum level? How can one get qualified for the training camp? Um, I feel like I'm not qualified to talk about this. Does someone else want to take it? For... Uh, sure. So after the platinum level, so you like go into platinum and then you just do the platinum problems. Uh, so there's like four contests. So you just do all four contests and then uh, the Usako coaching staff will just look at your contest performance and then they will choose like the top 26 people to join the Usako training camp. So the way Usako training camp works is actually, I think it's really well designed. So they split it into two groups. One group is first timers and the second group is second timers uh, or like repeat campers. So the first timers, they're just there to learn. They don't actually compete for an IOI spot. They're just there to like learn like more about Isako. And then the second timers, they actually do contests and they compete uh, to see who will represent the US at the IOI. So generally qualifying as a first time camper is significantly easier than qualifying as a second time camper. Uh, so it's not strictly just a top 26, but it's roughly the top 26. Uh, how difficult is it in contest promotion? It depends on like the, uh, it depends on the division. For example, like bronze, if you're a very strong programmer, like bronze, you probably will be able to in contest promote. Uh, but for example, like silver and then like gold, and it's like, it gets slightly harder. So this question, um, so for you, Siko, you have to fully solve at least two problems and at least half of another one to advance. Uh, Kind of pretty much actually for this, if you look at the old questions, uh, again, the contest for me personally, this is the most important page because it gives you a lot of information. Uh, you're able to actually in some of the old ones, they even do a breakdown of, okay, not here. They do a breakdown of like, uh, okay. The percentage of people who got what score, I can't find it right now, but in some of these contests, it'll show uh, right here is Detailed results for all of these promoted are here. When you click on this, it'll give you the list of people promoted. And if you scroll down, you can actually notice that sometimes people don't finish like uh, one and two full questions. It just comes down to the number of test cases you solve. So technically, yes, two questions and a half. But if, if you look at some of the older ones, actually, if we go to like gold, um, it'll show you, for example, sometimes you get, uh, sometimes you solve like, two questions almost, and then a full question, or this is not a good year, but basically uh, it'll show you the different types. For example, right here, we have like uh, not fully solved any questions, but still passes. It's just the number of test cases you solve. Okay. Um, so on the question, it does show you how many test cases you passed. So. Uh, this is the question. Does it show you how many test cases you passed? And if you actually go on, uh, what's the question I've done? This is not, okay. So if we go back to some of the other questions, you saw there were lots of different boxes, right? So it shows you the number that you passed right here. So if you've passed uh, 10 out of 10, it's going to be all green. And then if you have any red boxes, then that just means you didn't pass. So it will, this is the number of total test cases. And then for every box, it'll show in, in its simplest form, green or red based off of whether or not you passed. Um, 
Okay. This question, I'm also not sure if I'm qualified to answer. Um, Dr. Dean, would you like it? Sure. So uh, basically the contest environment for USACO is supposed to be the same as or similar to that for the International Olympiad, where uh, you're not allowed to use external resources uh, for that contest. And so during a USACO contest, uh, all of the code that you write should be from scratch and your own code. Uh, so you should not be using external resources like uh, web pages or other people's code or, or other you know, human beings during the contest. Uh, everything you write should be from scratch and, and your own code. You can use built-in language features. So if your language has already a, a data structure or a, a function that does what you need to do, you can call that function that's built into the language. Uh, and you can use language references uh, to make sure that you understand like the syntax of how to call a particular function, uh, but you're not supposed to use anything beyond that. So uh, if a problem involves you know, Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, uh, you're not supposed to look up Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm during a contest or copy code that implements Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. Okay. Um, is it a team competition or an individual competition? Uh, it is a strictly individual competition. This is online individual competition. Okay. Um, this question is asking about the difficulty of the problems in order. Uh, typically, I believe that the questions are supposed to be easier, but in some contests, it's definitely not true. Uh, so uh, I got advice from someone which is basically read all three questions beforehand. So you know, because some questions, sometimes like problem three will be a lot easier. Uh, typically, I believe it's supposed to be in order and in that uh, range of how easy it is. Okay, so other than the USICO guide, where can I learn C++? Uh, I believe the USICO guide isn't that much for languages. So uh, typically that's something you use once you already learned a language. For learning stuff like uh, learning Java or C++ or Python, there are lots of different ways you can learn. Um, a lot of places, for example, Coursera, have a lot of free courses where you're able to learn the language or definitely try out a lot of uh, textbooks. Uh, personally, I learned C++ after Java, so it was pretty much the same thing. Uh, I'm not sure how other people learned it, but definitely check out a lot of free classes. I know um, a lot of places do offer classes or do offer different websites uh, to teach you how to learn these different languages. Okay, so how many hours a week did you guys study to pass bronze? Um, yeah, I can take this one. Uh, this is sort of like a difficult question to answer because it depends a lot on like uh, the person. Uh, so for example, for me, I had a very strong programming background walking in. So I actually did not need to study at all in order to pass bronze. But that's because like, I've already been coding for many, many years beforehand. I would say that like if you're new to programming and you're looking to pass bronze, uh, like a good target could be like one hour a day. That would be like, like that pretty good. So you can put in seven hours a week, you know, that's like pretty good to like be able to pass bronze and move pretty fast. Uh, but like, yeah, in general, I would say that like, uh, if you're looking to do well in Yusako, you should try to find interest in solving the problems. It will be difficult for you to motivate yourself if you do not have like the innate interest in like uh, programming. So like if you actively dislike it, you probably will not do very well. At the silver level, how many students are there? I'm not 100% sure. Professor Dean, do you happen to know? I know for gold, it is like roughly 1,000. And then for platinum, it is roughly 200. Uh, 
Uh, so we'll get back to you guys on that after we run the query. Okay, uh, for this question, uh, if you earn an ICP, does your four, does the next four hours start right after? No, uh, it does not start right after. So, you know, you can like take a break and like come back the next day and then start it as long as it's within that like a uh, weekend window. Uh, but like, don't do it too close to the end of the contest because if, for example, you ICP, but then like you don't have enough time before the contest window ends, I think your time gets cut off by I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, you, you can like take a break between contests. If you ICP. Can fifth graders start doing bronze? Yes, for sure. There is no age requirement. Earlier the better. How do people who make it to plant and beyond manage their time? That's an excellent question. It's like up to each individual person. For me, when I made it to plat, I like uh, practice a lot over the summer once. So I would solve, I would maybe spend like three to four hours a day. Uh, I did not practice that much in comparison to like some other finalists. Um, but uh, it's like really up to you how you want to balance like competitive programming with other work. Oh, and Professor Dean put some interesting statistics in the chat. So 3,300 silver, 650 gold, and 220 platinum. Is it possible to lose spots when you are in platinum? I'm not 100% sure if I understand that question. It was asking like, can I demote from platinum to gold? No, you cannot. Uh, like once you get into a certain division, you're there forever. And then like, uh, yeah. Okay, I think we're a little bit over time. If you still have any questions, please make sure to put them in chat and then we'll try and answer them. Uh, other than that, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, that's pretty much the end of our workshop. Uh, we'll be holding a couple more with other topics. So if you want to come to those, it would be great. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. <laughs>